Today I'm going to show you how to upgrade your CR5 Pro and CR5 Pro H to a direct drive extruder, not with just any direct drive extruder. We're going to be using the Orbiter 2. Now if you've done any research into the Orbiter 2, you'll know that it's one of the most lightweight direct drive extruders with some of the highest torque for such a small motor. This comes in handy because we don't want to lose any speed when printing from the setup. And actually I think we should be able to increase speed with the setup because this can push a lot more plastic than the stock extruder now. So let's get into what we need to do to get this on that. So one of the first things we're going to need to do is we're going to need to take this apart and we're going to have to measure up and create something where we can put the direct drive extruder over. So we're no longer going to be using the metal cover for this hot end. You might be able to do that for yourself. For this purpose, we're going to be using carbon fiber PETG to print out a bracket that looks like this. That's what it comes out looking like, and there will be a link to the STL file for this bracket in the description below. So the first thing we're going to need to do here is we're going to take off the top of this and set it aside somewhere. Now we have access to the tool head. And what we need to do first is we're going to take this cover off by removing the screws that go to the BL touch, which you can get to from underneath. And we're just going to go ahead and move the Z axis out of the way in order to access the BL touch screws and the rest of the tool head screws. And now we can take off the BL touch by using one of the Allen wrenches that came with your printer. That's just going to be a screw here and a screw there. And once you've got the BL touch out of the way, we can see that there's two more screws that were going to the bracket that we're also going to need to remove those in order to get this cover off as well. And once those screws come out, then the bracket kind of falls away. So make sure that doesn't hit your build plate and you're going to put that somewhere nice as well. Then we're going to come over to this side and do the same thing by removing both of these screws as well. And once those screws are out of the way, this whole cover just kind of comes up like this. And I'm just going to cut off the zip tie I have here. You probably don't have this on yours, but we're going to make sure that we get the Bowden tube and this cable sleeve out of the way. At this point, I'm going to turn the power off to the printer. Uh, yours is probably off already. It's always a good idea to do so, but I'm, I was leaving mine on just for some light. And what I'm going to do is unplug the BL touch. That way I can feed this wire through here because we're not going to be using this anymore. Well, we'll be using the BL touch, but we're not going to be using this uh, case anymore. And now we're going to have to get this case off of everything. So unfortunately, that means we've got to take out the heating block and the thermistor from the hot end here. Before we do all that, we're going to make sure there's no more filament in, in the hot end, which you should do in the first place. I kind of probably should put that at the beginning. And then we're going to remove this Bowden tube and get this out of the way. And in order to remove the Bowden tube, what we're going to do is just take this little plastic clip holding it on here, remove that, and just like any other hot end, we're going to push this plastic, or we're going to push this clip down and pull up the Bowden tube, which is sometimes much easier with two hands, but you can get away with one. And then we're going to come around to the back side here and take off both of those two bolts holding the hot end in, and we're going to remove it up through the top here so we can get to the heater cartridge as well as a thermistor because both of those will need to come out. Before we remove the thermistor and the heating cartridge, you can open up this cable sleeving here and you can disconnect this cable connection here and this one over here, one is for the parts cooling fan and the other one is for the hot end fan. You'll just be able to tell by which colors they are coming off uh, each part. It's kind of hard to mess up, but just in case, uh, if you need to, you can label them anyway. But we're going to unplug those first and once those screws are taken out this whole hot end assembly just pops up like this you may have to wiggle a little bit and sometimes it's easier to take the silicone sock off but i didn't find it too difficult just to kind of yank up but we're gonna have to take the silicone boot off anyway because we need to pull the thermistor as well as the heating cartridge to do that on both we're just going to remove these two set screws one there and then one over here and it's a good idea to clean the nozzle or replace it now if you have to. And if you've used boron nitride thermal paste like I have, these things can get a little stuck. So you're going to have to push them out pretty hard with an Allen wrench or something. Just try not to damage it while you do so. But once those come out and this hot end is free, then we can push the rest of the wires through the top cover there. Now that the hot end is nice and free, I'd like to clean off the old thermal paste with some alcohol wipes and a little bit of alcohol on some cotton swabs and just kind of run it through there. And I'll be doing the same for the heating cartridge and the thermistor, just kind of wiping them down as well before I put the fresh paste on. But for now, we need to push this through and get rid of this uh, top cover here. Now that that is out of the way, we can put on this new top cover. And just to make sure everything kind of fits, and if for some reason this doesn't fit right now, the revised file will be in the link in the description below. 
but so far it's looking like we're good to go here. So what we need to do is reassemble the hot end and just kind of put it in place for now. So I went ahead and cleaned up the hot end a bit, got some of that old uh, paste out, still have a bit more to go. But what you should do now is if you've done this is uh, take some boron nitride thermal paste and cover the heater cartridge and the thermistor, that way it's going to get a lot better contact and you're going to have better control of your heating when you do this. Now the hot end's got some fresh thermal paste and it's put back together. What I did was bolt on the bracket just for test fitting purposes and then I pushed some of the existing Bowden tube down through the center hole uh, about to where the point of contact is going to be inside the hot end and what I'm going to do now is measure how much Bowden tube I need sticking out of here. So we're going to take our orbiter 2 over here, we're going to flip it down and down over here is where the Bowden tube goes into. So we're going to take our calipers. Don't judge me for the Harbor Freight ones, it's been, they've been good enough for me. Wheel down this thing, so we got this tip coming out here, and we're going to push it into here to about the point where this sits flat on there, and this is bottomed out, and we come up with just about 6.19 mil. And then from there I'm going to bring my calipers over here with uh, whatever measurement I decided it was going to be, and we're going to mark out on the Bowden tube where it sticks out from this bracket, which was like, I don't know, 6.19 or whatever. We're gonna do that and we're gonna make a cut there. That way we know we have enough Bowden tube going into the extruder and that it's not gonna be too high or too low. And for those wondering, this comes out to be about 26.85 millimeters long. And I'm just gonna cut a fresh piece of Bowden tube since that one's been in there for a little while to just about the same length. And now that we've got our fresh Bowden tube, we're just gonna put this back into the hot end and we're gonna clamp it and then throw the bracket back on. And now we're gonna bolt the bracket down just to make sure everything fits before we permanently install the extruder. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is just make sure that this is nice and flat. Mine is just a hair long, so I'm gonna cut it down probably by about a millimeter, but otherwise everything else is lining up pretty nicely. This step is gonna be completely optional, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, I'm gonna put some heat certs in here, some M3 heat certs using a heat cert tip and the heat certs themselves. Uh, if you want any of these, there'll be a link in the description below of where you can get these tips and these heat certs. However, if you don't use them, I believe this stuff is strong enough without having them where it's not gonna really move around. However, I'm just putting them in there just because, why not? So I ended up messing up the heat insert uh, job here. So I printed another one and I put my ADXL345 sensor on here as well because I'm going to be using Input Shaper through Clipper. Um, if you, this isn't a necessary step, but if you have Clipper, of course it's good to have. Uh, so I'm not gonna use the heat certs this time. I think there's probably enough plastic here that the extruder will be on there strong enough, but time will tell. So now we're gonna bring it over to the printer itself, get this installed, throw the extruder on top, and then tackle the wiring. So I bolted the bracket back on, and it feels pretty solid, which is nice. Um, I had to use on this side, since I've got the BL touch mount, some M3 by 10 millimeter hardware with a lock nut and a washer, just so it wouldn't uh, stick out too far and it would be nice and snug in there. So now I'm gonna to have to install the BL touch back where it goes. And then on this STL file, you'll see that there's a little uh, hole here, which I'm just going to run a zip tie through and kind of zip tie this here so this is all out of the way as well. After all that, then I'm going to put the extruder on here and then bolt it down. All right, so the BL touch is on. You can see the uh, sensor over here clears this just fine. And I'm going to actually zip tie this up once I have the wiring figured out. So I bolted the extruder onto the bracket with M3 by 8 millimeter screws and it's looking pretty solid so i'm pretty happy with that now it's time to go ahead and figure out the wiring so you might notice with yours that this is a four pin stepper connector and the one in the cr5 pro that comes out nice up here is a six pin so I had to kind of do an odd configuration of wiring like this um this is just temporary to make sure that this all works. Okay, and if you're looking at this configuration, it might be a little overwhelming to see at first, but so you've got the six pin connector, it goes into the stepper motor like this, and disregard the colors, but I just kind of figured out that if uh, this plug goes into the stepper and in this way, just, just exactly as that, and 
you have your connector here for your stepper on the new extruder, what you're going to do is you're going to match that first pin on the left where it says E1. That's going to go to the red pin on uh, this extruder. Then the second or the second pin, which is actually the third pin from the left here, which is shown with this black wire, that one goes to the blue wire on this uh, connector here. And then the uh, third one, which is the fourth one from the left, is this brown wire here, and that gets connected into the green wire. And then you have last the uh, green wire, which is the last one on the right over here. And that one goes and gets connected to the yellow. If I'm not mistaken, you can swap these two, especially if you have clipper and a board where you can change the polarity on, which I happen to have, but if not, uh, this configuration seems to work and seems to drive it in the correct direction. But after we clean up this wiring, we'll get into the configuration side of things for Clipper. The DuPont connectors that I have actually ended up not fitting in this piece. So what I did instead was just um, cut off the ends of these and cut off the ends of those and then matched them up one by one and then added them into uh, two new DuPont connectors like this. And it's a pretty solid connection, but I might still heat shrink it just, um, just to be sure. But now I've got the hot end heating up so we can test to make sure that extruder works. And once that does, we'll button everything up over here and then I'll show you what settings you need to use in Clipper. One of the awesome things about this extruder is that it comes with a lot of information on how to set it up. If you go over to their website here at orbiterprojects.com forward slash orbiter hyphen v2 hyphen zero forward slash, you'll go to the page that has everything you need to know here. So we're going to scroll down to firmware configuration here. And they do have firmware configuration for uh, RepRap, Clipper, as well as Marlin, which you would use here, and a whole bunch of other information that's really good to note. So what we're gonna do is go over the Clipper firmware configuration section, and we're gonna take a look at these values, and we're going to make sure that we add these in exactly as they have them here into our extruder and um, stepper driver area as well in our Clipper configuration. So in main sail, we're going to go over to machine and this will work the same if you have fluid and I believe it might be a little bit different for OctoPrint. You just have to find your printer config file. Um, so we're going to open up our printer config file here and I already have mine loaded here and I'll upload a copy of my configuration file as well just in case you're running Clipper and you want to make sure that you have yours set up exactly the same way. One of the first things to note is that the stepper driver here is a TMC2209 if you're using an SKR Mini E3 V3 like I am, but if you're not, make sure you put that in accordingly and take the information that you need from this page here and put it over in the sections that it corresponds to in here. You're going to have some values there already, so just make sure that you overwrite those values with the new values that are here. Of course, you're not going to want to delete anything from the section from your stock configuration, such as your sensor type, sensor pin, etc., because that's not defined over here on their web page, because that's going to be unique to your setup. So just make sure that everything that they show here is added in to these two areas and that's all you'll need to do and the configuration right out of the box worked perfectly for me so from there you can hit save and close and then restart your firmware and then test it out okay so it looks like we actually have some extrusion happening now so what I'm gonna do well it's like this and um, this is a step that you can take after it's all configured on your end is I'm just going to make sure that the E steps or in this case the rotation distance is correct with the factory settings. So I'm going to measure out 100 millimeters on this, mark it with a marker, and then tell the printer to feed 100 millimeters and then see if it's actually the correct length or not. To learn how to appropriately calculate your E steps and your or your rotation distance, there's plenty of guides on YouTube which are super easy to follow and it should only take you about five minutes to do. But here's a brief overview anyway. In order to calculate your uh, distance, what you're going to want to do is go from the top of the extruder just to about uh, 100 millimeters. I know it's slightly over, but that's not going to matter too much. And then we're going to tell Clipper to extrude 100 millimeters. You can see I put a little mark there. And we're going to measure how much it actually extruded from there. So that top line is exactly 100 millimeters. I told the printer to extrude 100 millimeters. So it should stop right there, and it did. 
which you can see, meaning we are spot on using the recommended settings from the factory for this extruder. I took the motor off again because I noticed while it was up there that these cables are not really in the ideal position and there's no strain relief here. So I'm going to add some heat shrink tubing here, kind of like a, as, to act as a bit of a strain relief on these cables. Hopefully that works. Other, otherwise, I think uh, for the price of this extruder, maybe an option to have uh, some strain relief would be nice. That should hopefully work a little bit better than what was there before, which was nothing. But if not, I'm pretty sure you can get these replacement cables for probably cheap. But I hate making these connectors, so I hope I don't have to make another one if it comes to that. Another thing worth mentioning is that these motors can get quite warm. So I'm just going to put a heat sink on the back here. This is kind of a bit big for it, but... It'll fit. I'll put some double-sided thermal tape on here, on there, clean these off with alcohol first, and then we'll bolt it back up there, and I made sure that this would fit and not interfere with anything while it's up there. Plus, it's a good idea if you're going to add any weight to the tool head now that you do it before you do your resonance testing if you're doing clipper or input shaping on Marlin. It's not the prettiest, but maybe I'll order an appropriate size heat sink in the future, but that should work. So now I'm going to bolt this down and then Try to use as much of the stock cable loom as possible to run this through and then back over to there somewhere. And I'm not sure what else I'm going to do, but I'll show you what it looks like. So I wasn't a huge fan of how that exposed wiring looked and I don't have any color matching cable loom, but that's fine by me. Um, so I just added some, some of this cable sleeving, some heat shrink there and some heat shrink down where it connects to pushed it behind this stepper motor and pushed it behind the old extruder motor. That way it's nice and out of the way, but we still have full range on this and it's not going to get caught up anywhere. So now our next step is we're going to have to figure out how long of a Bowden tube we need to run from here down there. And ultimately it's going to go into this dryer here because I print a lot of carbon fiber PETG and it comes out way better if it's constantly being dried. So that'll go back there somewhere and this is where your setup will differ from mine unless you're using the same exact thing. So just kind of figure out what's, what type or what size Bowden tube that you'll need and run it up along this cable here and then pop it into over here. If you have a Pro H, you're probably wondering if this clears the top cover and I'm happy to report it does. That's what the Bowden tube setup looks like and yeah, for some reason the heat shrink kind of pulled off of the uh, cable cover there so who knows why but that is a I'll fix it eventually thing other than that I have it running down the back through the stock little hole there and I'm gonna leave the extruder the old extruder on there for now just because I gotta get some prints going real soon got a whole bunch of orders in for these and they all take a couple days to print now because I have an orange Pi zero two running clipper I don't have an extra USB port so I have to put on this little uh, extension board here which has two more USB ports I don't use that full time because it does block the airflow from my fan here which maybe eventually I'll redesign all this but for now I'm just going to use this run the USB cord out of here because I'm using a Raspberry Pi Zero as a secondary MCU in order to run uh, Input Shaper. So I've got the ADXL345 plugged in down here, ignore the mess, to um, my Raspberry Pi Zero, which is going on like that. Now I just have to enable the clipper and then start the input shaping. And lastly, make sure that you don't forget to do a retraction test to find the best settings. For this particular extruder, they recommend one millimeter to one and a half millimeter. I'm starting at 0.5 millimeter and then working my way up from there. And then right after I find a sweet spot, then I'll test for speeds. And from there, after that, I'll do a calibration cube, make sure everything looks good. And then if we're good, then it's time for a longer print. And as you can see, this calibration cube, after some input shaping and some pressure advanced tuning, it's coming out quite well, so I think we can call this job done. So that's going to do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this coming up. And hit the like button if you like it, dislike it if you didn't. Leave a comment if you have a question. And remember, as always, keep it foul.